Tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is kind of relevant. If you think about the discussion of red versus blue or right versus left, a lot of the origins of the new left, the new right, come out of the 1960s. And tied to that, of course, is the reaction a lot of Americans had to the Cold War. All of this was tied together. And one of the more interesting personalities to come out of this and kind of an unusual example of the new right, if you will, would be Major General, retired Edwin Walker. So that's who we're going to talk about tonight. What I would like to do is kind of trace his life story a little bit, and you can see some of the development of the mindset that would set itself in some ways against many of the more prominent politicians of the day. And most clearly, that's going to be the case of John F. Kennedy his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, and his brother, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, or Bobby. And the, rea- the relationship that we're going to see between Walker and the Kennedys, well, let's just say there's no love lost between them, and you can kind of see that from pretty early on. But Walker himself was born in 1909 in Center Point, Texas. That's kind of center, central Texas, hill country area. He was a West Point graduate. He served in World War II, and then he also served in the Korean conflict. Now, his experiences in Korea are going to shape somewhat his beliefs regarding the Cold War, the nature of communism, the potential threat of communism. You can see it with concerns about brainwashing, which was something that they talked about even at the time. Uh, The picture there, obviously, is from the Manchurian candidate from 1962, when they're hearkening back to the exact same thing. The concern that there were soldiers fighting in Korea who were being brainwashed into supporting the North Korean communist perspective. And Walker saw elements of this. He was concerned by this, and he was concerned by what he saw as a perceived lack of patriotism. And as he described it later, he talked to a gentleman by the name of Dan Smoot, who had a news program called the Dan Smoot Report, and he told Dan Smoot that the problem he had with Korea was not just that the men under his command were lacking training, but they lacked ideals. And that was the concern he saw. A lot of the Cold War for him was going to be ideological on a grand scale. But that's what he kind of came out of. And then when he returned to the United States, time was going on. And he eventually became the head, the commander over the forces of the federalized Arkansas National Guard in 1957 when they were trying to make sure that the Little Rock Nine, the nine um, high school students, African-American high school students, were allowed to enter Central High School and actually attend classes. So if you came in a little bit earlier before the uh, talk began, they showed some silent footage of him in Little Rock. And there's a still photo up there that you can kind of get an idea about. But when he was in charge in Little Rock, as it turned out later, he talked about how he had completely disagreed with his orders. He did not believe that what Eisenhower had done was correct. He did not believe that Eisenhower should federalize the National Guard. They shouldn't be moving in a federal capacity at all. And in fact, the way he put it at one point was, in recent years, special interest groups have prevailed upon civilian leaders to employ our military forces on non-military adventures. And that's how he kind of perceived this. As he put it a little bit more bluntly, after Little Rock, he basically said, I led forces on the wrong side by the order of a president in 1957 and 1958. So he saw the whole thing as coming from the wrong direction. Now, part of that has to do with the fact that he came from a much more conservative background and coming from Texas in that time period, The Democratic Party is going to skew very conservative, particularly in the area of civil rights. And one of the things that Walker was concerned with was the idea of federal compulsion to force integration. And that was what he primarily had a problem with. He saw it as being too much federal control. And that's the kind of thing that over time he would see as being much more uh, dictatorial. But while he was in Little Rock, he actually met a man by the name of Robert Welch, who was the founder of an organization called the John Birch Society. And the John Birch Society was a 
fairly popular conservative group. Um, when I say conservative, think more like far right than just rather right. But they were the kind of people who tended to believe, and Robert Welch put this out in some of his publications, that Washington, D.C. was filled with people who were basically communist forces working to bring down the United States from within. And in fact, one of his earlier books, he argued that one of the people trying to bring down the U.S. was President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was actually a moderate Republican. So John Birch tended to be go a little bit further right than most people tended to see, and it helped an extremist label to stick on that society. But by the time you get into the 1960s, for example, both John Birch Society, a group such as, I'll mention this one later, the National Indignation Convention, I just like the name, honestly, and others like that, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy eventually labeled groups such as these not just a, trem a tremendous danger, but also called them vigilantes who, as he put it, sow seeds of suspicion and distrust by making false or irresponsible charges, which is probably one reason of many why Walker had problems with the Kennedy brothers. But what happened was he kind of felt himself in sync with the John Birch Society, became probably eventually one of its more well-known members, because he found a voice through John Birch for his own concerns. But in fact, when all this was going on, he was so disturbed by his role in the, using the National Guard in 1957, he did consider for a while resigning from the Army because, as he put it, you know, it was the, the fifth column conspiracy of communists working in the U.S. government and the influence in the U.S., which he said minimized or nullified the effectiveness of, as he put it, my ideas and principles. But instead, he ended up getting moved to Germany. And in Germany, he was in charge of the 24th Division, and it was there that his background in Korea and his concern with the potential fifth column in the United States kind of went an, an, an extra step. It was there he created a program designed to protect soldiers, prepare them for what might come their way in terms of communist threats. But basically, it came out of something that was a directive of the National Security Council, what they had encouraged people to do was they put together a directive encouraging training in history and in politics for federal, for Army, Navy, Armed Forces, and so that they could be better prepared for that sort of thing. Now, eventually, this directive would be rescinded by Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara. But basically, Walker took that idea and kind of ran with it. You ended up with a program that became known as the, the Pro Blue Program. And it was designed to provide, as he put it, a moral and a political foundation for his men. And he called it pro-blue, he said, because blue, he believed, stood for loyalty. And that's what he wanted. He wanted loyal men who knew what they stood for and were able to fight for the United States as they should. But the thing is, as time went on, there were people who looked into the pro-blue program and were somewhat concerned with what they saw. Now, one group that did this was were a group of journalists for a magazine, a, a newspaper called the Overseas Weekly. This was kind of admittedly a rag um, in Germany and elsewhere that they just kind of provided interesting news stories for the, the armed forces where they're stationed overseas, what have you. But they wrote an article about the pro-blue program where they pointed out that a good portion of it seemed to be tied to the John Birch Society. In fact, a lot of the material seemed to be lifted straight from the John Birch Society. And then they said even more than that, he was pushing a much more conservative perspective on his men to the point of even telling them who to vote for. Now, part of that had to do with the fact that he actually provided a 1960 voter's guide from a conservative group to kind of give them an idea of what to expect, that kind of thing. So all of this was put into the newspaper article. And as time went on, there were other things brought to light, how he had mentioned he had called Eleanor Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman both pinkos, which, of course, meant that they may not have been red communists, but at least they had that pink tinge to them. And they, they suggested that maybe he was going a little bit too far with his loyalty program. Well, the Army called him in to discuss a lot of this. And when they questioned him, eventually they decided the best thing they could do was disband Pro Blue in May of 1962 and then admonished Walker himself the next month. 
Now, as for Walker's perspective, the only reason this happened, he said, the reason Pro Blue was eliminated was because, as he argued, John F. Kennedy was trying to cater to the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev. So again, you can start seeing the ties there between Walker and the Kennedys. But he challenged this as censorship. He said, you had no right to do this. He actually left the army, rejected his military pension, and moved to Dallas. So from there, that's where his career really began to take off. He published a lot of things, such as one of the pictures over here, if I can get the laser, this right here, censorship and survival, talked about what he was planning on doing when he moved out as a civilian. He said, it will be my purpose now as a civilian to attempt to do what I have found it no longer possible to do in uniform. Then he took it further and saying, war has been declared. Every man is a soldier. Now, the war he's talking about is fighting communism from within the United States. And that's his concern. And where does he do this? Well, in Dallas. The picture there on the left is his house. It's on, it was on Turtle Creek Boulevard. The picture is from a couple of years later, 1963. Actually, he planted the U.S. flag upside down on his front lawn. He did this primarily because you fly your flag upside down as a sign of distress. His distress in this case actually had to do with the presence of the United States in the United Nations. But that's where he settled in and kind of put down roots. And well, why did he go to Dallas? Why Texas? Well, first of all, he was from Texas, but he was going to use this in his battle against the forces of communism within the U.S. As he put it in Amarillo in January of 62, he said, Texas is a vital portion of this nation. It is one of 50 states, but its influence and leadership are far beyond that of a single state among 50. Our traditions and heritage are those of independence and courage. Travis stood firm at the Alamo for Sam Houston's victory at San Jacinto. These were the terms of survival that established our heritage. These are not the terms that Washington, D.C. has now devised, if you hear what he's saying, or the ones that divided Korea at the 38th parallel. He saw Texas as the perfect example to strike out against the forces of darkness and move the United States back in a more positive direction. So what he decided to do, of course, was to run for governor in 1962. Now, he ran as a Democrat. This was not surprising, given the time period. Pretty much it was assumed for a long time, of course, in Texas history, if you won the Democratic primary, you might as well just say you've won the whole thing because there's not much of a competition beyond that. So he ran as a Democrat for that capacity. He also tended to be much more conservative in areas such as the area of civil rights, which plenty of Democrats in Texas also did. But he ran as a Democrat And he put it, I am fighting in and through the party of Jefferson, where the greatest number of Texas patriots can express themselves on the basic and vital issue of national survival and where we can meet head on opponents of the Jeffersonian states rights tradition. And that's what he's taking to the people. Now, when he ran, he actually tried to get clearance from a lot of fairly well-known politicians. He went to Texas Senator John Tower, for example, for his blessing. John Tower told him not to run. He went to the South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, who also told him not to run, which is kind of ironic if you think about the fact that Strom Thurmond actually ran as the Dixiecrat candidate in 1948. He was telling Walker not to run. That tells you something right there. He also had wanted to meet with Barry Goldwater, who would eventually in 1964, of course, run for president. But Barry Goldwater refused to meet with him as far as we can gather. It was primarily because he didn't want to be associated with Walker. But he had a lot of people telling him, don't do this. But he did it anyway. And he had all sorts of interesting competition. Uh, what he considered to be some of the most interesting competition was probably John Connolly, who, if you don't mind the spoiler, ends up becoming, the course, Democratic candidate. But he labeled him as Lyndon Johnson's hand-picked candidate. For him, that was the biggest problem, that Johnson had even recommended him. Other people had gone even further than that. One guy named J. Evitz Haley, who would eventually be known for writing a book called A Texan Looks at Lyndon from a very antagonistic perspective, called John Connolly Lyndon's Boy. But Walker became one of six candidates in the Democratic primary for the governor. 
And during the campaign, he was willing to tell you who he stood against pretty easily. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was, of course, no longer president, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, the State Department, the Supreme Court of the United States, and Nelson Rockefeller, who wasn't really going anywhere, although there was some consideration that he might end up being a, a presidential candidate. But of all of these, in particular, he was going to focus in on Kennedy, Johnson, and their administration. He was very concerned that Kennedy was, as he put it, prosecutor and judge of all of Walker's activities. Walker saw himself very much in this time period as being the target of a vast communist conspiracy trying to root him out before he could shine a light on their nefarious deeds. And he thought that Kennedy was in charge of a lot of this. But worse than that, one of the biggest concerns that Walker had as a former soldier was that Kennedy as he put it, plan to place all armed forces and weapons under the United Nations. That was his biggest concern. If you bring it in to a multilateral organization like the U.N., the U.S. no longer has control, and that was one of the biggest problems he saw. As a result, both John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, who he said supported all of this, he called them the Pot Potomac Pretenders and challenged them at almost every step. He did the same with Johnson, talked about how Johnson double-crossed every true conservative and even every ultra-liberal in Texas. And if Johnson was going to try to challenge him on elections, well, he said, well, Johnson had done more to destroy free elections than any man alive. If you remember what happened in 1948 when Landslide Linden managed to win the way to the Senate by a mere 87 votes, that's probably what he was referring to, but again, made it very clear that's who he's running against, not so much the other gu gubernatorial candidates as Kennedy, Johnson, and, well, Bobby Kennedy, who he mentioned in one interesting throwout phrase how Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, had slurred Texas history. There's, I don't know what he meant by that. I'm kind of curious, but needless to say, Kennedy's were the problem in a lot of this stuff. Now, while he was running for governor, of course, you go out, you have all your press conferences, you make friends with the press. Uh, he had a really unique way of doing that. For example, he had a press conference at the Austin Municipal Airport in March of 62, and you had plenty of newspaper journalists and photojournalists taking pictures and what have you, and he told them to stop. And they told him, well, we have the right to take your picture. He said, yes, and I have the right to tell you not to. And in fact, one of his supporters who was there actually pointed out to one photographer, he said, well, if you want a face full of fists, just take another picture. So the relationship with the press was, shall we say, uh, unique. Happened again when he went to Washington, actually, in April of 62, to speak before a Senate committee. Um, after he had spoken, a journalist by the name of Thomas V. Kelly actually approached him and asked him why another person who had spoken, the leader of the American Nazi Party, George Lincoln Rockwell, had praised Walker so fully. And, well, Walker's response was to punch him and give him a black eye, which Kelly was nice enough not to press charges. But this was not unusual for Walker. He had a very contentious relationship with the press. In fact, at one point, it was in 1963, a year later, he went to a luncheon held by the Dallas women's group called the Public Affairs Luncheon Club, where George Wallace, the segregationist uh, governor of Alabama, was speaking, and Walker was in attendance. And a cameraman by the name of George Phoenix decided to come up and try to get a silent, some silent footage of Walker watching. And what ended up happening is that Walker stood up, grabbed Phoenix, threw him up against a table full of plates, knocked all the plates over, and proceeded to pummel him in the back, and then went and sat back down. And apparently a few people applauded, but not members of the Public Affairs Luncheon Club, because that's not showing a lot of decorum. But he had, a, let's say, an unusual relationship with the press as a result of this. But even with, shall we say, a colorful campaign, he still came in sixth out of six candidates. It was an interesting thought. It didn't pan out quite the way he had hoped it actually would. But by the fall of 1962, he had a new focus. What happened in the fall of 1962 is that James Meredith was going to be trying to enroll at Ole Miss in Oxford, Mississippi. 
And there was a lot of contention and debate around the process of integrating college campuses, particularly across the South. But in September of 1962, James Meredith was trying to matriculate, and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy sent in 127 U.S. Marshals, 316 members of the Border Patrol, and 97 members of the Federal Bureau of Prisons to come in and make sure that Meredith could go in. But Walker went along, too. And what Walker wanted to do, he said he was in Mississippi to show opposition to tyranny like he had seen in Little Rock. He wanted, as he put it, to encourage massive, peaceful protest against federal tyranny. And he urged other people to do the same. As he put it, I am certainly not in sympathy with any efforts with forced integration, which seems to be the issue at present. So he made his point very clear, what he was attempting to do. But word began to spread as everything was kind of coming together in Oxford that whether this was a rumor or not, there were some armed men who seemed to be following the call of Walker, which was pretty clarion, and they were making their way to Oxford. And long story short, what happened was a riot. Students were using bricks, rocks, sticks, all sorts of other things, and Walker was present in the midst of all of this. Now, the question is, how involved was he? And there's some debate as to how involved he was. The UPI reporter who was present said Walker was actually calling for peaceful protest, was standing out of the way, and was not involved. The AP reporter disagreed. So there were people on both sides saying whatever they wanted to see. But eventually what happened, and you can see it from the picture on the slide, well, Walker ended up being arrested at the encouragement of Bobby Kennedy for rebellion, insurrection, and seditious conspiracy. But where they handled it from there made life a little bit more interesting because he didn't just have him arrested. He put him under basically a 90-day observation and mental examination. There was some concern that that Bobby Kennedy had that Walker might not be quite as stable as he should be. Uh, This was not the first time anybody had suggested this. When he was in Germany, there had been some question if he maybe had a brain tumor or something along those lines. But they threw him into basically a federal prison reserved for psychiatric and mental prisoners. And that's where things started getting interesting because the whole question was, Shouldn't he be having just a regular jury trial? Why are they putting on trial for his sanity? And there was a huge debate about this. Uh, Representative Bruce Alger, who represented Dallas in the House of Representatives at this point, asked Congress to protect Walker's constitutional rights, including the right to have bail and legal representation, challenged him being put into this federal prison at this level. And across the country, he became kind of the cause celebre for a lot of what was going on. There was a group of women, for example, in Los Angeles called the Minute Women. You would see organizations like this across the country. And the Minute Women sent in petitions protesting this type of psychiatric treatment simply for what they considered to be a conservative position. The Dallas Morning News noted that the only person in Oxford who got this sort of treatment was Walker himself, and even the ACLU made a statement at one point, which tells you something right there. So this was a huge hue and cry over what had happened, and eventually it was determined that there was nothing wrong with Walker, and they eventually exonerated him and sent him home. And when he made his way back, well, this is the picture when he got back. About 250 people met his plane at Love Field with, you know, Confederate flags flying and signs like Walker for president in 64, which I think would have been fascinating. I would have been intrigued. But singing for he's a jolly good fellow and everything else. And he's back. And he was kind of the immediate hero of the day because of what had happened at Ole Miss. Now, after that he kind of picked up steam a little bit. He ended up linking forces with a guy by the name of Billy James Hargis. Now, Hargis was a fundamentalist preacher from Tulsa who founded in 1947 a group called the Christian Crusade. And in the spring of 1963, they basically rented a bus and went on a six-week tour around the country to have kind of mutual support or mutual admiration, what you want to call it, bringing in some money, splitting the profits, but they called it Operation Midnight Ride, kind of being 
a kind of throwback to the idea of the midnight ride of Paul Revere to wake people up and alert them to the situation in the country. And they thrived on controversy when they did this because, of course, we mentioned his love affair with the press. It continued when he was working alongside Billy James Hargis. In fact, it got to the point where they would deliberately have press conferences before they actually held their meetings so that the journalists could say something and they could focus all this attention on the controversy created there and then they would have their meeting. But apparently it did reasonably well. At least he was pleased with the results. But once he returned home... He got back to work because, of course, it's going to be April of 1963, and, well, your taxes are due. Well, what ended up happening was on April 10th, he was busy at home and on Turtle Creek Boulevard doing his taxes when suddenly the bullet hit the window frame of his window, went through the far wall, fragments of the bullet hit his forearm, cutting him there. Plaster and paint from the window frame ended up landing in his hair. Eventually, they found the slug in the next room, having gone completely through the wall, resting on a pile of pamphlets that he had there. So somebody had shot at him. They just didn't know who. And that was the big question. And when they pulled out the slug, the, 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 the bullet itself was so damaged, it was really hard to tell at, at first what was going on with it. Eventually, they did some testing that it seemed to indicate it was what's called a Carcano bullet. But that's not going to have a whole lot of significance yet. It was a long time trying to work through a lot of this stuff. But in the interview that they did show, if you noticed before, before the talk, he talked about the enemy within this country calling for the end to the HUAC and to the local police and to the military, the enemy within that was striking out against him in his own home. And he saw himself as a target of all of these forces. Now, he did close out the interview with a bit of a laugh. He cut it short because he said, you know, if I don't actually finish my taxes, as he put it, Bobby Kennedy's going to throw me in federal jail again. So he went on with his life. But the question was, well, who shot at him? This was clearly an assassination attempt. That's certainly how he saw it. So where did that go from there? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. It was going to take some time to get to the point where people realize what exactly was tied in there. But before that... By 1963, the far right in Dallas had really ramped up in a major way, and Walker was a big part of that. And you can see it, among other things, in what they called U.S. Day in October of 1963. What happened is the 24th of October is United Nations Day. And in 1963, they were going to bring in the uh, ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, to speak at Dallas Memorial Auditorium. And he was going to talk about the United Nations and how we're working together to create, you know, a better future for everybody. Well, this rubbed Walker the wrong way for a variety of reasons. He hated the U.N., as the picture with the flag flying upside down in front of his house should indicate. But his big concern, of course, was that it's multilateral. Multilateral forces mean no autonomy for the United States. And since the Soviet Union is a member of the Security Council... That means that they exercise a lot of sway over what the U.N. is going to be doing. As a result, he would say the United Nations was atheistic and, as he put it, Asiatic. He said it was, as he put it, our Tower of Babel. And then he, of course, tied it into the Kennedys because that's what you do. U.N. One World New Frontiersmen have conspired in the liquidation of our constitutional government, he said, by, for, and of the people. They are buying and selling the nation. Now, clearly, the New Frontier reference is that to Kennedy, who is, of course, championing the New Frontier in American domestic policy. But he decided to join forces with an organization that I mentioned before, the National Indignation Convention, which I like just for the name alone. It was founded in 1961 after the United States Air Force had been training Yugoslavian pilots from behind the Iron Curtain in Fort Worth. And this was of great concern to them. And you could see how the U.N. might be orchestrating some of this to their mind. So Walker decided to create, in response to U.N. Day, U.S. Day. And he was going to hold it in the same auditorium, Memorial Auditorium, the day prior to U.N. Day. 
And when he got in there, he stirred up the crowd. He suggested that they should go and hear Adlai speak and get, and challenge him where he was and see where you go from there. And well, apparently when he was talking about this stuff, there was at least one person in the audience of note to us for later, a gentleman by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald was actually in the audience during U.S. Day listening to Walker speak, told his wife he attended an ultra-right meeting, as he put it. Well, that all kind of comes together. These are all puzzle pieces. But what happened was the next day they had U.N. Day. Adlai Stevenson came and was trying to speak, but a lot of people who supported what Walker was doing poured into Memorial Auditorium, tried to shout him down. They brought air horns. They made it very difficult for him to speak. And then when he was finished, as he was trying to make his way out to the car, at least one person, a college student, spit at him. And then if you look at the picture there, uh, he had a placard dropped on his head by the woman. If you look at her, the picture of hers over to the right, Cora Lacey Fredrickson. Mrs. Fredrickson there later said that her hand slipped. And she didn't mean to actually clunk him in the head quite the way she did, but... That basically fed a lot of the reputation Dallas had at this point for being a little more than right wing. And this is in October of 1963. This is one month before John F. Kennedy was planning on coming to Dallas to try to work on ways to make nice with Texas Democrats who had a major problem with him for some of the same reasons Walker did, trying to prep for the 1964 presidential election. So... All of this was coming together at the same time. So when you get to November of 1963, when Ed Kennedy came in, one of the things that met him was a lot of the same flyer, the Wanted for Treason flyer, which you see on the slide. Walker himself did not create this flyer, but he, would, he knew the gentleman who did, and he had worked with them in the past, so there were some ties. They, they were kind of of same mind. And so there is some indication that he was at least aware of the flyers when they went out. The same thing was also going to be true. The picture of the uh, Dallas Morning News ad that says, Welcome, Mr. Kennedy. The same man who put together the Wanted for Treason flyers also helped pay for the ad, the full page ad in the Dallas Morning News, challenging Kennedy for his foreign policy that seemed frankly too communistic to be real. But again, there's those ties with him and Walker. But of course, we all know what happened on November 22nd of 1963 with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, with people pointing fingers at the new right and particularly the far right and blaming them for what actually was happening. Now, it didn't take too long, of course. We found out over time that you had Lee Harvey Oswald, the gentleman on the right, who was involved in the shooting, among others. And then... The question is, what do you do with that? The Warren Commission was going to be rooting out all the different in pieces of information. It turned out even before it got to the Warren Commission, there was a German newspaper at the end of November who actually argued that not only was Lee Harvey Oswald guilty of killing Kennedy, but he was the person who had actually shot at Edwin Walker. And in fact, they were the ones who put this out before anybody else did. Not even an American newspaper got to this first. And so as a result, Marina Oswald, who is in the picture on the left, was eventually questioned by investigators. And through the information that they got from Marina Oswald, the Warren Commission determined that, yeah, in March of 1963, Oswald had practice some surveillance on Edwin Walker on his house, you know, checking his goings out and his comings in. And then in April, yeah, he had shot at him. And in fact, the same type of bullet they determined it eventually to be, the Carcano bullet, is the same kind that was used in the Kennedy assassination. But Marina, when she explained this to the Warren Commission, she said a lot of this was because, and he, as he put it in a letter to her, it was due to his hate for the fascist organizations and their beliefs. That's why he was targeting Walker. He was so far right, Oswald didn't want him there at all. Marina said that Oswald had told her that it was best for everybody that he got rid of Walker. As he put it, you know, what would you say if somebody got rid of Hitler at the right time? and that he saw it as kind of the same thing. Now, the evidence for this she provided to the Warren Commission was a letter that he had written to her. Now, most of his material that he had written out, a lot of it he had destroyed himself. 
It had all been burned in his bathtub. She kept this letter. In fact, she hid it in a cookbook. She was doing that as kind of leverage to protect herself and protect their child from Oswald. She said she was trying to keep him from beating her again, basically. But that was why he had shot at him. That's why he had attended the U.S. Day. He was so astounded by Walker. He just didn't know what to do with him. And it's, it's admittedly a controversial conclusion but Walker himself was more than happy to kind of pick up with this idea and run with it. He called the assassination attempt the April crime. And he said it was probably not just Oswald. He said it was Oswald and somebody else. He assumed it was Jack Ruby, who, of course, was the person who approached Oswald when he was being moved after he was arrested and shot him point blank. Walker thought the two had actually ended up working together. And, in fact, Walker would go even further than that eventually. He argued that Attorney General Bobby Kennedy had known about Oswald and had, they had had him in custody. He released him, and all of this was the result, that if that had not been the case, Kennedy would probably have been safe. But as it was, he said Kennedy, as he put it, knew his assassin. So Walker was putting all of this together in his mind. But after the JFK assassination, one of the things about the far right in Dallas is it does tend to temper down a little bit because of the focus that a lot of people had before Oswald was arrested. There were still elements that remained. Walker was no exception. He would continue to speak, although his audiences were not necessarily as big as they would have been before. But he continued into the 1970s in kind of weird ways. Uh, first of all, one thing, towards the end of his life, he did try to fight to get his pension back. He eventually did get that back in 1982 uh, when Ronald Reagan was president. He got it with back pay. But he had a couple of run-ins with the law on his own. These were not necessarily affiliated with integration efforts or anything. He was arrested twice in uh, Dallas Parks for public lewdness, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but otherwise, he continued to try to put forth his own ideas on what was happening with Oswald and the Kennedys and how all of this basically intertwined. He said if there hadn't been a conspiracy against law and against justice and against himself, Kennedy, he said, would still be alive. And he said if only Walker could have known what Oswald was capable of doing, if somebody had just told him, he said, all of this could have been avoided. He said the FBI was aware of it, the Dallas Police Department was aware of it, but protected him anyway. But he put these ideas forth along with a lot of other interesting things that tended to be a little bit more on the fringe, but largely disregarded, but eventually lived out the rest of his life and died in 1993 of colon cancer. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people tend to forget who he was. Um, even at the time, though, there was at least one person, John Leadham, who was the Republican county chair in Dallas County in the early 60s, argued about Walker. He said, you know, he wasn't as prominent as you're making him out to be. And admittedly, he's not a figure on a grand scale. He's certainly not, say, Kennedy or Johnson or even Lee Harvey Oswald. But he was intertwined with a lot of the major events of the early 1960s. And as a result, he's certainly an interesting player in it. And the, the way everything fits together, it just makes for an interesting story. But hopefully that sheds a different light on some of what was going on, giving his own perspective. Thank you very much. Tom? Our first question is, what inspired you to prepare all the prodigious research that you obviously have done for this presentation? Well, I've always been kind of interested in the Cold War, and I was actually doing some research um, up at SMU at DeGallier and other places, looking at how the Cold War played out in Dallas in particular, and I got more and more involved in what was happening with the far right in Dallas. Um, I thought about maybe doing some work. I wrote an article that was about SMU, for example, during the Cold War and how they navigated that in the area of uh, academic freedom. But I was looking at a little bit of everything, and Walker's name pops up here and there. And he's just such an interesting guy. 
I just kept having to look. Um, he, you can't really look away from somebody like Edwin Walker, I don't think. And he had a lot of interesting things to say and was more than happy to share all of that in, publicated for, in, in published format. Um, but I just kind of caught, caught up in it, I think. Another question we have is what were some of the challenges you had while doing your research? Well, one of the big challenges is that I still have yet to go to the Center for American History at UT Austin, where his papers actually are kept. Now, a lot of those papers have been digitized and have been put online, but not everything. And I would have to be able to get down there and spend a good deal of time. And just the time period that I was trying to do this research, that was simply not feasible. So that's one thing I would like to do long term is be able to get down there and rifle through some of his papers. That was probably the biggest challenge. Was there any particular point or insight that you had? Because not many people have studied Walker on a comprehensive level like you have. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular insight that kind of uh, you felt like was new to your, you added to the body of knowledge about General Walker? That I added to the body of knowledge? Given what I've seen... I think I brought it to a wider audience, but beyond that, I'm not really sure. Well, I think what's marvelous is how you've put it, compiled it into mm-hmm. one uh, meaningful presentation. Thank you. Okay, we, here we have some more questions. Wonderful. From our virtual audience. <laughs> Any idea why Walker was so against his picture being taken by the press? Uh, we saw from the presentation that there are certainly pictures of him that exist. So why was he only against certain pictures being taken by the press? And I might add to that question, most politicians want their pictures taken. Yeah, that makes him it makes him kind of unusual. And I'm not exactly sure. It was just it was one of these strange situations where he just told them that he'd had enough. And I think they may have been getting a little bit too close and may have seemed a little bit too intrusive. My guess, and it's hard to tell because a lot of this is coming out of newspaper articles that don't really speculate, but my guess on a lot of this is it felt like it was teaming up with reporters who might be asking questions that were a little bit more um, accusatory, for lack of a better term. Or confrontive. I'm sorry? Confrontive. Con- yeah, confrontational. But that may be part of it. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It could have been argued, and I think some people probably would have done this, that sometimes he did behave in a way that was slightly off kilter. That was not unusual. The fact that he grabbed the one newspaper, uh, the, the one uh, TV cameraman, and threw him into a pile of plates just to get him out of his face, that's not something people normally do. No. <laughs> and he, uh, wasn't even, he wasn't even the main part of the whole, the, the, the whole luncheon. It was George Wallace, but he just didn't want that camera there. So. Is there any particular moment from the Kennedy family that the Kennedy family noticed and took an antagonistic stance towards Walker? I can't imagine that Bobby Kennedy would have let, had Walker take a psychiatric evaluation with, without some prior escalation. He was a little bit concerned over how Walker behaved. Now, Walker had a bit of a reputation. In fact, there are a couple of uh, movies that came out in the early 60s that a lot of people say are based on Walker. Um, one was uh, Seven Days in May. Uh, one that's much better known is the Stanley Kubrick film, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Uh, the general that kind of dives off the deep end is said to be loosely based on Walker, perhaps. Um, there's no way to really tie that together for sure, but that's certainly been what a lot of people have suggested. And apparently Bobby Kennedy did say at one point that the reason field commanders had no power of decision over tactical nuclear weapons was because of people like Edwin Walker. And he said as much. So he saw how Walker had behaved and how he appeared to be at least to Kennedy's eyes somewhat unbalanced. And I think, again, like you, like I said, there's no love lost on either side. Well, to follow up on the first question, mm-hmm. um, the politicians I've known mm-hmm. relish the camera in front of their face, wherever they are. Right. <laughs> Whether they're at church or, or a mass meeting of some sort, they love having their picture taken. Mm-hmm. So obviously he didn't have any, uh, I won't say obviously, he didn't appear to have A press person advising him on how to deal with the press. It doesn't look like it, does it? (laughs) I don't. I don't know. Uh, But uh, 
it's certainly a, a, you presented a marvelous presentation. And thank you, Dr. Adrian Caulfield, for thank this you. delightful talk. And come back when she's back uh, in the spring and see you on okay. December the 1st. Thank you.